Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm David King. I'm an associate professor of public policy at the Kennedy School. My job is to introduce the person who's going to introduce Governor Lamb. I want to uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I'd like to say especially thank you to the, uh, the folks that are checking in to us tonight from our World Wide Web site. We have live audio is carrying our forum events now. Uh, and we were targeted today as the site of the day for USA Today. So we have plenty of viewers coming in through the World Wide Web tonight. Uh, here's a little update on the news. As you may have heard last night or this morning, Bob Dole has asked Ross Perot to get out of the race at this point. You know, Bob Dole is down 20 points, and he could presumably could use the eight points that Ross Perot might be able to pull. Perot has just gone on the wires and said, uh, quote, I think this is weird and totally inconsequential. <laughs> now, uh, an awful lot of Americans think that Ross Perot, of course, is weird and totally inconsequential. <laughs> now, unfortunately, that's a view, a pervasive view of political parties, the third political parties. We have in this country a two-party system. It's very unlikely to change because of the Electoral College because of the way we elect uh, public figures at the local level and the national level. It's very difficult for a third party to uh, become nationally viable. The last nationally viable third party was the Republican Party, which replaced a party in 1856. And traditionally, political parties that, third political parties, or fourth or fifth political parties, have emerged on the fringes of American politics. But over the last 30 years, there is a clear, distinct trend it's very easy to see in public opinion polls of elites and the masses. Party supporters, strong partisans in the Republican Party and strong partisans in the Democratic Party have become more extreme and more ideologically cohesive. So that today, the average Republican candidate and the average Republican strong identifier is more conservative than the average Republican 20, 30 years ago. Today, the average strong Democrat is more liberal than the average strong Democrat 20 and 30 years ago. There is a growing gap between the interests of the average American voter and the interests of party elites and their candidate. So today we have a possibility for third parties emerging not on the fringes of the distribution, but in the center of the distribution. That's where our guest comes from tonight. And that's also part of the one of the major topics of Eunice Grork's study group here on Tuesday nights. Eunice Gwork is an Institute of Politics fellow this semester. She was Lieutenant Governor of the state of Connecticut under Lowell Weicker and Independent. And she was the Independent gubernatorial candidate in 1994. And did quite well, surprising many people in the polls, but not winning. She's here to teach students in the Harvard community uh, about third parties, and here tonight to introduce Governor Lamb. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. And uh, although uh, a loss is never happy, in some ways there's always a victory. And I think coming as an IOP fellow and working with the undergraduates and members of the Harvard community in our study group on Tuesday afternoons has certainly been uh, a repayment in many, many ways for uh, what was uh, not a successful run in 1994 in Connecticut. I think that uh, David made an interesting comment about the fact that increasingly people are becoming interested in and seem to be supportive of, at least intellectually, uh, third parties. And as a third party candidate and with the privilege of introducing uh, former Governor Lamb tonight, I think that one of the things that at least our study group has talked about and has heard a little bit about is it just takes plain courage sometimes to do that uh, kind of thing. But let me describe Governor Lamb's background to you, and I think that you will understand uh, some of the courage that he had this summer when he stepped out. He was born and raised in, in Wisconsin, and he attended the University of Wisconsin and graduated in 1957. He then joined the Army and served as a first uh, lieutenant uh, stationed both in Virginia and Colorado. After he left the Army, he attended the University of California at Berkeley, where he earned his law degree, and he became qualified as a certified public accountant. 
1961, he returned to Colorado and he opened his law practice and at the same time had the happy occasion to meet his wife, Dottie, to whom he has been married for 33 years. In 1966, Dick Lamb was recruited by the Democratic Party of Colorado to run for the state legislature. He ran and he won and he served there uh, for a number of years. He announced his candidacy of governor of Colorado in 1974. He was successful and he upset an incumbent in a governor in that race. He served for 12 years or three terms in Colorado and upon his departure uh, had joined the University of Denver as the director for the Center of Public Policy and Contemporary Issues. This past summer, as I think we all know, and as you've alluded to, he announced his candidacy for president of the United States of America in the Reform Party. He lost uh, his chance for candidacy, and I didn't know how to put this quite, uh, because um, it was an interesting circumstance, which I'm sure he'll describe, so I called it a battle with Ross Perot. Those are the statistics of, of Richard Lamb's public life. But it should be noted that both as a member of the Colorado legislature and later as governor of Colorado, he took some very, very courageous stands. He introduced and passed the country's first abortion rights bill. He established for himself limits in his uh, contribution limits in his campaign for governor. And he was one of the very first governors in the country to sign a limit on state spending, uh, a bill that limited that. It was this kind of courage, I think, anyhow, and I'm sure you will agree after we've heard his talk and from what you know already, that probably figured in his run for the president. He has con continued to speak out on runaway federal deficits, on illegal immigration, on rising health care costs, and other issues which pertain to all of us as U.S. citizens. It is with great pleasure and a very deep honor that I present to you the former governor of Colorado, and candidate for office of the President of the United States of America, Richard Lamb. <laughs> Eunice, that was lovely. I appreciate that. David, thank you. Your excellence in teaching has preceded you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, are, and actually is, is a known way out in Colorado. I'd like to start off with a parable, but which I may be apocryphal, but I think is a true story. It seems that John Stuart Mill woke up one morning with this overriding, incredible feeling that the answer to the question of the ages had come to him in the middle of the night, and he forgot what it was. <laughs> he writes of this immense frustration because he knew that an epiphany, this great insight had come to him and he just had no idea what it was. So he put a quill and parchment next to his bed and about two weeks later he woke up and written in his handwriting were these words, think in different terms. Think in different terms. If I could have that first slide, I blew my own line. <laughs> written were these words. You know, the, 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 the poet used to say, new occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient good uncouth. And Lincoln picked up that same idea when he said, you know, as our case is new, so must we think and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we will save the nation. Well, it is my thesis that we're going to have to really think in different terms about public policy. That, in fact, sort of nothing in the past has prepared us for the kind of challenges that the younger people in this room are going to have to face. This is the scariest slide, public policy slide, that I have, have ever seen. <laughs> We're getting it. We're getting it. This is from the Bipartisan Commission on Entitlements. Um, this is, um, this is what, chaired by John Danforth and, and Bob Carey. This shows that by 2012, the current revenue structure, the current taxes that we now pay and complain about, applied to the revenue that we anticipate in 2012, will only fund entitlements and interest on the debt. Nothing else, nothing else. There'll be no Defense Department, there'll be no White, White House, there'll be no executive, there'll be no judiciary, there'll be no national parks. Then in 2029, when my daughter will be getting ready to retire, the current revenue structure, the taxes we pay right now and complain about, will only fund four of the existing programs, Social Security, Medicare, uh, federal retirement, and Medicaid. 
Now, it is my thesis that nothing that we've done in the past has prepared us for this kind of decision making. You know, we've really been very lucky in this country. We've been able to dis distribute the bounty of a growing continent, and we haven't had to make tough decisions or hard decisions. We've never, I mean, this has been a wonderful place to be a politician in because you can almost give people more and more and more. When I entered the Colorado legislature, America was doubling its wealth, its per capita wealth, every 30 years. Well, that, that's a great growing pie that you could distribute. But when you look at this chart, we're, talk, we're not talking about national public radio. We're not talking about the Council on the Arts. We're talking about making a series of decisions that'll make our moral compasses just simply gyrate, simply gyrate, if I could have the next slide. Now, in a way, this is a success story, and I really want to po uh, point out that this is a success story. We've added 30 years of life expectancy this century to human life expectancy in the developed world. That's a terrific thing. Most of the younger people in this room, or most of us in this room, are going to be able to see our grandchildren graduate from college. I mean, that's really unthinkable at any other, other age. 10% um, of the people over the age of 65 have children who themselves are over the age of 65. Wow. I mean, and, 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 and it's really a, an exciting, exciting story. But if I could have the next slide. Um, it, 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 we, we've increased the population in the United States this century a little over three times. We've increased the population of people over 65 10 times, and we've increased the population of people over 85, 20, 30 times. And one, one of the problems we have is that those of you that are interested in public policy in the future are gonna have to run this nation of 50 Floridas. Where you, where you simply have, when I got out of college, the average age in America was 23. It's now, it's not, that was 1957. It's now 34, it'll soon be 38, and we have every reasonable expectation to think it's gonna go to, to 40, which means that public policy is gonna have to run a, a, a country with twice the average age as it's run at any previous time in its, in its history. Again, good news, if I could have the next slide. Um, uh, it average, you know, average age at the time of the Declaration of Independence was only 17 and a half. So if, if you have to run an America over the average age of 40, um, boy, it's, it's almost like if David and I are, are playing chess and somebody comes along and kicks over the whole chessboard. I mean, it's sort of, the, the, you can't get there from here in the current public policy dialogue. You can't get here from there. You just can't. You, I mean, you, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not talking about uh, decisions of Medicare that we can't make now. We're, I mean, those are going to be the easy decisions before you get very far into the next century. If I could have the next slide. And we don't even know. I read an article in the Futurist magazine the other day. This is a famous Life magazine where half of her face is when she was 20 and a beauty queen, and the other half of her face was when she was 80. But I read an article the other day that's saying the toughest decision for the younger people in this room is what they're going to do between the 14th and 15th decade of their lives. I mean, you know, wow. George Burns dedicated his last book, he said, to the widows of my last six doctors. <laughs> Agatha Christie was married to her beloved husband, Max. Max was 14 years younger than, than, than uh, she was. And he was an archaeologist, and she used to say, God, it's nice to be married to an archaeologist. Every year you get older, he gets more interested in you. <laughs> so it really, it really is a success story, but it's a public policy challenge of just incredible proportions. I'd have the next slide. So we're in, in this time of convergence, where we're not growing fast as economically as we used to. We're an aging society. The fastest growing group is old, old. The fastest growing cohort in America are people over 100. Willard Scott gets 400 letters a day to congratulate somebody, a week, to, to, get, to congratulate somebody over 100 years of age. We have this exploding technology, we have rising expectations, and boy, does it present us with some problems. I'm raising my hand, if I could raise my hand when I get a, when I want the slide change, would that be okay? Okay, but look what's happened. A typical middle aged couple who retired in 1981 has already received back from government not only all of their Social Security taxes with interest, but all of their federal I income tax that they've ever paid. We've got our children tied to two systems that are bound to bankrupt them, that are just simply unsustainable. I mean, this isn't a matter of ideology. If I would have voted for Social Security, if I were there, I would have voted for Medicare. The, tr the dilemma is that the, the New Deal has become a, 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 an, uh, is obsolete. I mean, it, it, you can't. It, can't. it can't survive the demography of the future. Let's go, if I, if I could have a, the next slide. 
Um, oops. Yeah, next slide, yeah. Also, the second system then is the healthcare system, although that relates also to the entitlement system. But this an average American who turns 65 in the 1994 uh, can expect to receive $200,000 worth of health care before they die. Again, that's more money. That's more money than most, of the, than most people have paid in federal taxes all of their lives. So it's like musical chairs. We got, you know, that it, 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 we've got our children and grandchildren tied to two systems that, that at some point the music is going to stop. I mean, it, it, we, well, and you can't even even discuss it. I heard coming, the cab driver had the radio on as I'm coming in here today, listening to the high level of ads on both sides of the Senate race. If I could have the next slide. So we've, we've created two monsters in the younger people in this room's um, future. They're just incredible uh, monsters. And, and the problem is, we, it's not that, that they're, every generation has challenges. There's nothing wrong with having challenges, but it's that we can't, uh, we can't even talk, talk about them. Next slide. This is my debt, you know, to, to you. People talk about a $5 trillion uh, federal debt. I would suggest to you that it's not a $5 trillion debt. It's really a 14 to $17 trillion debt. When you talk about what the next generation is going to have to pay off for obligations that Eunice and I, anyway, ran up, um, you have to add in the, the unfunded liabilities. You simply have to. There's a, there's un, we, we put no money aside for military pensions, no money aside for federal civil service pensions. We haven't adequately funded Social Security. I mean, we've got, that'll mean a dollar that, uh, I've, I've come up with a concept that I call costs of the future. If you really say, what costs have my generation imposed on the next generation, it isn't $5 trillion. It's 14 or $17 trillion, depending on how you do it. Next slide. So, I mean, I said, I, I'm, I'm afraid, it says free tax cuts, and it, it says in there, in that vending machine, insert your grandchildren. <laughs> that's all, that's all. It's a Faustian bargain. I mean, yeah. my aging body can prevent your kids from going to college. Next slide. So, I claim that my generation has been guilty of generational malpractice, and I think the full extent of that generational malpractice will really come very clear in the next 20 years. I think retiring the baby boomers is going to be one of the great challenges that this society ever has. And I know when, every time I hear that, I keep thinking of that, the, the movie, The Graduate, you know, where the guy says plastics, you know, plastics. And, um, but seriously, I think, might be wrong, but I think that this is going to be as big a challenge in the next 40 years as race has been in the last 40 years, or maybe race and gender has been in the last 40 years. Next slide. Um, I don't, can't think of the right metaphor for what I think we're doing to the next children, but Goya got it a little bit close, if I could have the next slide. So one of the things that we've had is that this has been a wonderful time to be in American public policy. Peter Drucker says, who the gods would destroy, this is what this says up here for those that can't read it, they first give 40 years of success. And so, like in the healthcare system, we've built up the healthcare system and we've built up our medical ethics and our expectations of our public and all these other things under the most massive transfer of wealth that any society has ever put into any sector. We've never put, you know, you've never had a sector that, evolved. when I was uh, in, when I got out of graduate school in 1961, we as a nation spent 6% of our gross national product on education, 6% on defense, 6% on healthcare. Today we spend 6% on education, 3.8% on defense, going down, 14% on health care, stabilized, but how long stabilized, we don't know. So this is the Social Security. This is my legacy to the younger people in this room. Terrific. I mean, this is, this is Social Security. We know it's, it's, it's an actuarial nightmare. When the baby boomers start to retire in uh, 2008, when they, they turn 65 in 2011, you, you just simply, all of our systems turn to actuarial mush. This shows, this shows the tail, what they call, actuaries call tail that is on Social Security. Money that, this is money that we don't have funded, that you're going to have to come up with to support, um, to, to support the next generation. There is no trust fund. You know, Ernest Hollings says, Social Security trust fund, he said we would have been better if we would have invested in Confederate war bonds, he says. <laughs> And so this is the return. Even if it was payable, it's becoming a decreasingly secular feast. Social Security pays off. It was a hell of a deal for my father. My, father, um, my, my father's 88 years old, um, in good health, wonderful health. He retired when he was 61, started drawing Social Security when he was 63. Uh, he's received back 40 or 50 times what he paid into Social Security. And my daughter will be lucky to pay, get her own money back. Something wrong, something wrong. 
But this just simply shows the magnitude of the problem. The further out, there's no way that growth of the economy or taxation can make this, make this up. Now, some, there'll be some people in the room that will want to the dialogue on that question, but you, there is a couple of more simple things we can do in Social Security. I mean, if your Social Security, if you raise the retirement age in a faster clip than we've anticipated, if you start to reducing COLAs by, let's say, a half or one percent, half a percent or one percent, if you actually include it in the tax base, there's three or four fairly simple things that will extend the life of that. But Medicare, Medicare is just an actuarial nightmare. Next slide. All right. Uh, is there something up there I can't see either? Okay. So there, there is, um, and, and, and is, this, is this true? I mean, I get it. this isn't a matter of ideology. It, it's not a matter, it's a matter of public policy and whether we have the maturity to be able to, to, to face some issues in this country. So he said, as Lester Thoreau says, there's simply no justification for Social Security welfare system that taxes those. You know, the average person that pays a Social Security tax has got less money than the average person that receives a Social Security tax. Now that is a deceptive figure because Social Security is the best anti-poverty program we've ever passed. It is a very important program. But there is an awful lot of people that simply don't need it also. You know, we've got 600,000 millionaires get a Social Security check every month. 20% of the millionaires in, in the United States are on Medicare which means there's young people in this room, or at least that, that are in this community, who pay taxes, who can't even afford health care themselves, who are paying my father's health care, who could well afford to pay for his own. Next slide. There's that. that it, so that, 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 that says this bench is reserved for the poorest people in this country, and these old couple are sitting there, and the kids are coming along and saying, would you move over? Would you move over? And that, that I think, is the, the metaphor that, that I'm trying to do, that, we, we, it's, and again, it's a success story. For the, for the first 20 years of my political career, I thought poor elderly was one word, you know? <laughs> it was oh, poor elderly. I mean, what are we gonna do about poor elderly? I mean, but it's a success story now. The, the, uh, the, the elderly are no longer disproportionately poor. In fact, I think I have put a slide in, if I could have the next one. I think I have a slide in that. Um, I can't really read that, but the, uh, some of you can, but they talk simply about the welfare generation. I mean, the, the dilemma is we can't even talk about um, Social Security and the idea that I would tell my 88-year-old father that he's essentially on welfare, that he's the recipient of a transfer payment, which is the real nature of Social Security, would be almost, almost unthinkable. Next slide. So, under the most conservative Republican budget, the most cruel, hard-hearted Republican budget that was presented last time to Congress, we would have added $1.8 trillion to our kids' debt. That was called unthinkable. That was called unthinkable. And look, I'm, I come out of the democratic tradition. I'm not be being partisan. I don't, don't agree with the idea of giving a tax cut with the money, but it does show that we can't, if that's the closest we can get to a balanced budget, and we couldn't even do that, and that would be, I mean, there's a, the, the red menace. <laughs> I went to the University of Wisconsin from 53 to 57 when Joe McCarthy was running around the, and talking about the red menace. Well, I got a red menace, too. His, his wasn't right. Mine is right. My red menace is this tidal wave of red ink that we're, we're coming to the next generation. Next slide. So we've got to find a way to better balance the interests between the elderly and all of the elements of our society. Next slide. This is, of course, is, this, is the Medicare fund. This is this slide I just had made recently. It's already obsolete. Medicare isn't going to survive until this date now. It's going to go either 2001 or 2002 or the next recession, whichever comes first. Next slide. But let's break this down then. Let's talk about public policy because I think think in different terms. I think we're going to have to think in different terms about literally everything, not only entitlements. We're going to have to think about retirement policy. We're going to have to think, you know, we're still supporting widows of Civil War veterans. Uh, retirement policy is a, a glacial. You've got to give people, the baby boomers have to have uh, 30 or 40 years to start making adjustments. If the, if the Medicare and, and Social Security is not going to be there under the same terms as it is now, they have to react to that. And retirement policy has got this incredible lag time uh, um, in, in it. And so when you break that down, uh, this entitlement problem, you got the retirement policy and then you got health care. Now, health care has been growing at two and a half times the rate of inflation during my professional career. Next slide. 
So in, when I got out, as I mentioned, when I got out of, when I entered the legislature, we as a country spent the same amount on health care as we did education. Today we spend the same amount on health care as we do education, defense, prisons, food stamps, farm subsidies, and foreign aid. It simply is crowding out everything else that we, we do in the budget. Next slide. And um, I'm intrigued by this because Darwin, uh, Darwin said it so well. He said it took me a long time, to, more time to find out what the, to define the problem, essentially, than to solve the problem. And I think that that's the think in different terms. We, we have to rethink about how, how we define a problem. Um, I, I, I think that in the, in a, I, I'm, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about sustainability. I think sustainability is one of the key concepts of the future. And sustainability really requires us to think in different terms. It requires us to think about shortages as maybe not ex you know, excessive demand rather than in inadequate supply, et cetera, et cetera. If I could have the next slide. But David Eddy says, one of my, my, one of my mentors in the healthcare, um, Dave, David Eddy, um, says you gotta accept that resources are limited, that everything we do in healthcare prevents you from doing something else. That's, that's my public policy rule. Everything in public policy prevents us from doing something else in public policy. Harvey Cox, the theologian, says not to decide is to decide. And so when you, when you go on in, in, in these areas, you've got to recognize that that um, in healthcare, it is, we, we, if once you, I wrote an article called Better Healthcare Through Rationing. It's only when you really admit that resources are limited that you can start prioritizing and buying the most healthcare. That is one of the thoughts in different terms. Next slide. Because, look at, look at my generation's legacy. Look at, look at what it is. More US children die at birth. More of them die in their first year. More of them are addicted to alcohol and drugs and more of them are, go into the, prison, uh, into the uh, prison system. More of them go into the workforce, not being able to read or write. Um, this, this society has no sense of proportion. We look, at, we look at certain things in healthcare and we think, oh my God, that's sacred. Uh, and, and so we, we fund it, but there's all kinds of other demands and this society has. And it's very difficult to make these kind of things in, in, in health policy to suggest that maybe we, sh maybe we shouldn't do certain things in health policy and, and do others in social policy instead. Next slide. And this is the way, the way medicine was practiced for most of human history. Voltaire said in 1776, he said, the role of a doctor is to amuse the patient until nature affects a cure. <laughs> well, that's pretty right. I mean, that, they didn't have that many things you could do th that back in those days. But now, next slide. We, it's awesome what we do. I was, uh, you know, there's 24 implantable parts we can put in the human body. They're doing the genome. I was in Japan looking at the healthcare system. I saw a wristwatch that if I were wearing it and had a heart attack, it would automatically dial 911 and hone the ambulance in on where I am. Uh, if I had a heart trouble, would I want one of those? Would it be an expectation, would it be an entitlement? Probably would, next slide. Uh, we're working on the, uh, the, the transgenetic uh, transplant, animal-human transplant. Next slide. Um, the genome project. Gosh, well, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on. Next slide. That's a gingerbread man running out of that building, and the professor's uh, doctor saying, what a humiliation. The home economics department has beaten us in the race to create life. <laughs> Next slide. But, as George Bernard Shaw says, says the mark of a truly educated person is to be tr truly moved by statistics. You know, there's, there's 40 million people out there that don't have basic health care. Um, and, and how we get people to be truly moved by statistics, those are human beings. Those are, uh, I mean, they're, they're live human beings that are going without health care, but, it's, it's, uh, but you don't see them, it's not dramatic. Um, Stalin once said, um, one man's death, he said, that's a tragedy. He said, a million men's death, that's a statistic. And, and in a horrible way, he was right. Next slide. So, I think that you, um, in world season, what, what other, what, <laughs> what, what kind of guy would show uh, the favorite Yankee during the world season, the world series? But, uh, you know, should, should we have given uh, him a transplant, Mickey Mantle a transplant? I mean, he had a coexisting morbidity factor. 
How do we set limits in a world where the medical genius has outpaced our ability to pay? The, 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 yeah, no nation can, can distribute more than it, it earns, although my generation has tried by putting it on your credit card. Next slide. So John Kitzhaber comes along, now governor of, uh, governor of Oregon, and he starts this Oregon plan. He says, we ought to give prenatal care to all women before we give transplants. John Kitzhaber thinks in different terms, thinks in different terms. And I think he's absolutely right. Colby Howard died on the front page of the Denver Post. He was a little boy, didn't get a transplant. But when you really look at what Oregon did, I mean, Colorado would have been so much better off during my 12 years if we would have done what Oregon did and given everybody good basic health care instead of trying to do some super rescue uh, medicine for just a part of the population. So, so let me show you very quickly. Here was my concept, my constipated concept of health care when I entered the Colorado legislature. I got sick, went to a doctor. doctor gave me pretty good care. So here's how I was going to reform it. Next slide. I was going to make the whole thing work faster until I started really looking at this and I'm saying, what, what really brings health to society? Another think in different terms. How does a society buy health? Next slide. So I go to, I go to all of a sudden you, you realize that the biggest, uh, the biggest thing in health of a society is its habits and its genetics and its lifestyle. Um, we all know that now. Of that 30 years of human life expectancy, H HHS says only five years has anything to do with allopathic medicine. So then I go to England to study the healthcare system. Next slide, and I see all of a sudden well-being on the thing. The English, the English, they keep class statistics. Only place in the world that I've seen that keep class statistics, and they, and they say that class one professional at most age groups has half the mortality and half the morbidity of class five labor. And 40, 40 years after the National Health Service, you still have, after 40 years, class one professional has half the mortality and half the morbidity is class five labor. The higher you go up in the British service, civil service system, the healthier you are. The higher you go up in the British military, the healthier you are, even though everybody has access to the same health care system. So I add well-being. Actually, this is Robert Evans' slide. It adds well-being to that. And then I go to Japan. Next slide. And Japan says, well, the reason we're so healthy is we spend so little money on health care. Wow. That's thinking in different terms. Japan comes along and they said, look, how's the best way to buy health for society? 20 years of being elective office, nobody ever, I never heard anybody ask, how do you buy health for society? We were always saying, how do you fund health care or, you know, what's, but we weren't really keeping our eye on how do you buy health for society. In Japan, after the Second World War, de devastated society, and they simply said, well, the best way to buy health for society is to give people a good diet and give them a job, <laughs> give them, you know, give them a sense, of, a sense of recovery, give them a rising standard of living. And so I, I'm absolutely intrigued about how a society sort of addicted to health care can think in different terms and, and get to start thinking about health. Next slide. Which we have to do. This, is, this shows that this is the drop in, in, in mortality in the United States. And, and the rise of health care cost. And it's practically, there's practically no correlation. I mean, we, we, we had most of our drop in more, the reason that we live longer is because of sanitation and refrigeration and, and the fact we don't have to salt meat as much and we have screen windows to keep mosquitoes out and soap and it's the public health people that have really done such a great job. So I, in terms of thinking in different terms, next slide, I would suggest that what your gender, what, what we have to do is start thinking. Uh, this is my 88-year-old father. Um, I've, I've looked at the polls. What do the elderly want? You know, you ask the elderly, what do they want? This is what they, uh, what's up on there. They want meals on wheels. They want resource, aging resource centers and emergency response systems. And they want all these nice kind of other things. My, the, my father does not want to die diapered and demented in the corner of a nursing home. He's more afraid of what the health care system will do to him than, than what it will do for him. So. How do we get this? Uh, I'm 61 years old. I'm arguing for rules that I myself am going to live and die under. But it seems to me that we should ask, as Dan Callahan does, that at some point you have to change from cure to care. At some point you have to ask, how do we set, set limits uh, in this? Next slide. Uh, let's go. Let's skip that one. I'd rather go to questions. So um, 
I argue that the inadequacies of one part of the system have to be funded by the excesses of another part of the system. That would be another new rule of public policy. What are the new rules? Next slide. That being in government is like sleeping with a blanket that is too short. You know, your shoulders get cold and you pull the blanket up around your shoulders and your feet get cold. I mean, it's that, that you, you, you we, we have to have a better appreciation of the limits on resources and we have to understand that you can't buy compassion by putting it on your kid's credit card. Boy, that was a definition of liberal in my, in, uh, all of a sudden it dawned on me. Boy, you can vote for all kinds of well-meaning programs and then just simply put it on your kid's credit card. That's easy to do. But we've got to uh, do a, a new concept that, that I would suggest, justice across the generations. You've got to not only add distributive justice, being worried about the, the poor people in society having access to health care, but a new concept saying also, also you gotta, if, you, if it's truly charitable, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. Every generation should pay its own way. Next slide. So uh, I'm intrigued by the, the, the uh, an ethical issues that are inherent in, in that kind of uh, dialogue. Lester Thoreau says healthcare issues are essentially, an, a large part of them are ethical issues, and I agree. Next slide. Look, lady, it says, you're the one that wanted a, you wanted, you're the one who asked for a famous movie star with deep, dark hair, strong nose, and deep set eyes. For those of you that can't read that, it's a sperm bank and she's holding Mickey Mouse. Next slide. So in a world of limited resources in, in healthcare or anything else, the decision, the explicit decision to pay for one thing is an implicit decision not to pay for another, another thing in the healthcare system. Next slide, which puts us into this world of trade-offs where we simply have to recognize we trade off between high technology medicine and basic health care and young versus old and all these other things. Uh, we, we're moving into a world of trade-offs and one of the things that we're all searching for is what yard sticks, what, what, um, sort of what standards do we use to, to make those trade-offs? It's, it's very difficult. Next slide. <coughs> Next slide. So, but I think it's really important to ask the right question. This is the thinking in different terms. When you ask what do people die of in the United States, this is what you get up here. How, how you know, uh, cancer, um, heart disease, stroke, uh, things like that. But there's always going to be a 10 leading causes of death. You know, I t I've looked, been around the world twice looking at healthcare systems. I was shocked to realize that worldwide, the death rate is one per person. <laughs> no kidding. I think we have to ask, why do people die before their time? Next slide. When you really ask what an epidemiologist says, why do people die before their time? Why do they die before their dreams are finally figured out? Then you get a whole different set of answers. I mean, if there's always going to be, it's like the, the bad people that t 10 most wanted in the post office. You know, you catch one and another one goes up. Well, there's always going to be a 10 leading causes of death, but we have to ask ourselves, why do people die before their time? And you ask that in public policy, you get tobacco, alcohol, lack of di diet, lack of exercise, those kind of things that you see on the screen right there. So if you're really going to say, how does a society maximize its health for limited dollars, then you have to start making sure that we're asking the right question. Next slide. But you've got to go beyond that, too. You've got to come up with some of these other th statements. Uh, feudal care. What is feudal care? What is inappropriate care? I had one of the slides that I skipped. I said one of the big challenges of health reform is to try to recognize that resources are limited, that we already ration medicine. In fact, my argument is that no developed country denies as much people as much health care as we do in the United States. And, and you have to um, then start thinking about what is feudal care. And Next slide. This is, this is, the, this is uh, end stage renal disease, kidney dialysis. Notice the fastest growing use of kidney dialysis is people over 85. And the second fastest use of kidney dialysis is people between 75 and 84. This in a society that had 600,000 women last year give birth without adequate prenatal care, 79,000 of them without any prenatal care. It just doesn't compute. I mean, it doesn't, you, you, as harsh as it might seem, uh, some of these slides I'm about to show you next, it's the kind of dialogue that I think we're going to have to have. Next slide. 
Helga Wagley up in Minnesota was in a persistent vegetative state. 700, her, her husband refused to discontinue the life support system. She was 86 or 87. $700,000 later, she died. Rita Green died two years ago in Washington, D.C. Rita Green fell into an irreversible coma, comatose, irreversible, vegetative, the year that I was a sophomore in high school. January, October 24th, 1952, Rita Green fell into a coma. She, she was kept alive 42 years in Washington, D.C., who has an infant mortality rate higher than Guatemala. Is that really the way we want to spend money? Yes, next slide. So I am, I am interested in how do we, how do we start a dialogue on these tough ethical issues? I would say we should have no uh, CPR, no CPR if you have uh, a coexisting morbidity factor or if you've got an Apache 3 score of 120 more, that's a severity index that the doctors use. If you have uremia, in other words, we should simply say that at certain people it doesn't, you know, I, I, there was, I have a friend in, in Boulder that her, her, mother, her mother's heart stopped 35 times and they started it up again until the family blocked the door and let the poor lady die in peace. Next slide. Also, continuing on this for persistent vegetative state. I mean, you know, it's, it's a tragedy. I, I mean, if, if it was a relative of mine, I think I understand that, that heartache, but um, does it make sense to keep somebody alive 42 years in a persistent vegetative state? So I would suggest, a snoo, you know, no new medication, no new, uh, uh, no diagnostic tests for somebody in a persistent vegetative state. These are, this isn't, it's not the answers that I'm giving you, it's the nature of the questions that I think is so, um, so important. Next slide. Okay, now lastly I'd like to talk a little bit about a sustainable society. Think in different terms. The last thing I think that we really have to do is talk about how do we have a sustainable society. Next slide. I'm intrigued by that because uh, there, that I think that the, that the Industrial Revolution gave way to the Information Age and the Information Age is, is going to give way to sustainability. How do we, how do we adjust to um, making a sustainable society? Next slide. Um, this is a home uh, in Denver. It takes about 30% of the average, um, average household's income. Ne next slide, a lot of it to heat. The next slide is a house in Boulder, which is even higher, that doesn't even have a furnace. It doesn't have a furnace. It's heated by the water heater and well insulated and passive solar. So you can, see, you know, one of, one of the things I think we have to think about is that how do we how do we build and organize our society so we, we, uh, we make use of limited resources, not only limited money, but limited resources. Next slide. That's, of course, um, how most of us get around, whether it's uh, today from Logan Airport or whether it's in Denver. But um, um, the, 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 um, Amory Levin says, Amory Levin says, wait a minute, there's more oil under Detroit than there is under Texas. Amory Levins thinks in different terms. Next slide. He points out that if we all drove cars like this, we would have a surplus of domestic oil. We wouldn't need to import 50% of our oil from abroad. That's thinking in different terms. Next slide. I think the same thing, a question about, uh, about the dem demographic size of the United States. I've taken a great interest in immigration. How? It, it, used to be, it used to be that nobody asked you know, whether you, you, you got better or you didn't get better because God decided. You know, it wasn't up to us to decide whether we lived or died. And we came along and we said, no, that's not right. And then it used to be up to God how many children a, a woman had. And Margaret Sanger came along and said, no, that's BS. We, we can control that. Well, I think the new one is we, we have to think about the demographic. How, how, how big a country do we want to have? Next slide. The, the question of immigration is a question of whether we want to stabilize the United States or whether we want to grow to double our size and double our size again. It's, a, it's essentially the question of sustainability. There's a lot of different views. There's Pat Buchanan's view on immigration, but I think ultimately the question is how big, how, what's our destiny? Next slide. Do we want a country of 500 million people? Do we want a country of a billion people? Next slide. 
The first census in the United States found, in 1790, it found four million Americans. That means we've had six doublings of American population in our short 200 years of history, six. Two more doublings, just two, we've already had six. Two more doublings gives us a billion people, more people than in India. Is that really what we want? Next slide. I think that there's three questions in immigration, essentially. How many people can we take? Um, who should they be? And how should they be chosen? But they've got to make some decisions about what do we want to leave? Should there, should there be two people in the United States? Would that be good public policy to have two people in the United States for every one that's here, here now? It's something we can now decide. Next slide. The last slide. I'd like to, the last question that I've been working on is this question about how do we reform our, our institutions. I think the next big challenge of public policy is to reform the legal system, the healthcare system, the education system. I point out that our systems now have become a matters of international competitiveness. That, that, that healthcare system and the legal system, if that's a drag on our economic wherewithal, we've got, we've got a new problem. Next slide. Almost done. So that the United States, in fact, is a gulliver held down by a thousand special interest Lilliputians of one type or another. Last slide. Next slide. So I think that, we, that and along that, that line of uh, thinking in different terms, we ask, do we need more courts or do we need a better way to resolve disputes in our society, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think we have to reconceptualize the problem. We don't need... I mean, in Colorado, we had plenty of courtrooms for the next hundred years if only we would adopt some sort of no-fault automobile system or something like that. Next slide. So I would suggest to you that capital is the stored flexibility that we have to build our children a better future. Politicians can print money, but they can't print capital. And there's not as much about it as there was for your generation as there was for my generation. That there's an awesome new pressure on those limited dollars. And we've got to do something about it. Last slide. And as Jacques Chirac says, he said, politics is not the art of, of the possible. He says, that's not right. He says, politics is making possible what is necessary. And I love that because I think that that's what my generation didn't do. We started, uh, we, we are leaving the next generation unsustainable systems. We're leaving it in healthcare, we're leaving it in entitlements. We're leaving it in so many other areas where we simply have to think in different terms. Thank you. We turn now to you. We have two microphones. I'd like you to come up to the microphones, tell us who you are, uh, where you're from, and ask a question. Don't make a statement. And we have uh, 10 minutes left for questions. Go ahead. On this side of the room, then we'll switch sides of the room back and forth. My name is Mona Miller. I am a student here at the Kennedy School. And I'd like to thank you very much for um, your activism and speaking out on what is actually often peddling castor oil, is I guess um, sometimes how you must feel because of the uh, issues that you're really raising. Um, there seemed to be um, perhaps something of a um, paradox or an unanswerable problem um, in your discussion in that the age, uh, the median age is rising to um, 40. So we're basically asking an older and older population to vote for the changes that are in fact going to affect them. And I know that you are taking on this battle by starting to have this conversation. Um, but I'm wondering what else we can do to try to change um, public opinion and being willing to tackle this. Um. Uh, I, th I think there's a, a bunch of different things. First of all, don't get discouraged. I mean, you know, there was one woman in my law school class. One woman. Now, you know, it's, the things change. Along comes uh, Gloria Stein and Betty Friedan, or along comes David Brower in the environment, or Rosa Parks not re moving to the back of the bus. I think that, that change can happen, number one. Number two is that we got to at least talk about it. You can't, a, a problem well-defined is a problem half-solved, as they say, and I think it's really important that we start talking about it, and I, that's what, sort of got me so discouraged about the Democrats. I didn't join the Democratic Party to blindly transfer money from the young to the old. You know, rich to the poor, maybe that's okay, but young to the old, I don't, I don't quite see it. Um, and my friend Tom Damore and Paul and Eunice's uh, example, I've really got, I've started thinking, wait a minute, 
are we ever going to, America can't do politically what it needs to do economically to leave you a decent world. So I'm starting to think, how do we get together a plurality? How do we get together a plurality of people who can make hard choices? I can go to a senior citizen. I did this summer. Tom DeMoore sent me down. He was my campaign manager. He sent me down to Palm Beach to talk to senior citizen centers with my message. Wow. <laughs> but about 40%, thir a third of a 40% of the seniors, boy, they care more about their, I bet your grandparents care more about you in a way than they, than, you know, and, and I think that that's what we have to do, put together a plurality that can make some hard choices. Hi, I'm Laurie Trevino. I'm the project coordinator for the Visions Project here at the Kennedy School. And actually, I had a very similar question to hers, so um, rather than do that, I'll ask you another question. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on uh, whether you think the Reform Party is a viable um, party to make any change um, in our political system, um, given the current situation with Ross Perot and such. Yeah, it really is interesting. Toynbee once said that the same elements that build up an institution eventually lead to its downfall. And, and I'm really hot. You know, it takes a guy like Ross Perot to start a third party. You know, it, it, it cantankerous, uh, strong-minded, and probably wealthy these days individual. But. Um, he, he, I, I think that he overstayed his welcome. He, you can't have a political party that is this, the, the subdivision of Ross Perot or anybody else. So I think if he democratizes, if we are able to democratize the party after Nove November, then in the Reform Party, we have to ask ourselves, is, the, is it still a viable institution? I think it is. It's on the ballot. It'll be on the ballot in about 30 states. It will have at least ballot access, and I think that's worth fighting over, yeah. Hi, my name is Ben Allen, and I'm from Los Angeles. And um, I, ever since I started reading about you in Time Magazine, I've really admired the works you've done. It seems that your vision is very future-based. And um, I, I appreciate your message so much that I <laughs> snuck into the Reform Party convention to vote for you in Long Beach. Um, yeah, I'll tell you, it was so, I mean, I know you didn't even get a ballot. I, that's what I heard. But I, I wasn't a member of the Reform Party. But I still cast the but vote. But you got to vote. Right. Um, so I, I was disappointed in many ways by the way that, well, just looking at the, being there at the, at the convention, I knew that uh, the, the, the deck was stacked. But um, who in the public life, the, in the political world of America today, who do you think shares? your same concern over these issues. Oh. And, and who would you say might be some visionary, some, some other people in public life today who can carry on this message? Uh, Alan Simpson, Bob Carey, um, Paul, so Paul Songus, Tim Penny, um, Lowell Weicker. Um, I, I mean, there's, believe me, there are people out there. I, I'm convinced there are people out there. Um, the, the dilemma is that it's, it's uh, somebody told me about it, it's like all the penguins on the edge of the ice floe, and one of them had to jump in, and if, they, if the sharks didn't eat them, then others would have jumped in. Uh, others jump in and swim, and I think that the, the difficulty is that no, there's no, I mean, uh, you know, Lowell, Lowell Weicker essentially says, well, Lamb, I told you so, don't, get, don't play ball with Ross Perot. And I think you've got to have the vehicle, but there is straining to be born in this country, a fiscally responsible, justice across the generations, but socially tolerant political party, and I think the Republican Party is going to go through an intensive time of self-examination. The Democratic Party, I think, is also going to, it's not as obvious, but they're going to go through an intensive examination a lot of, around a lot of these entitlement issues and campaign reform. And so I do think there's a possibility that we can put together a third political party that can Try to get a plurality, just like you couldn't, just like you couldn't get slavery uh, abolished through the normal political process. You know, th third political parties have brought us slavery, women's suffrage, uh, minimum wage, child labor laws. I do think that whether or not we become a dominant party or just, you know, Richard Hofstetter says the role of a third political party is to sting like a bee and then die. <laughs> well, I mean, that's okay. If we, even that would be worthwhile if we could get entitlements and campaign reform. I think that would be worth it. You know, don't, the, the important thing is don't you know, keep up your, your, your I, I know you're not saying that you do anything different, but this is still a self-correcting system. I mean, it is amazing. 
you know, I, I wandered into the Colorado, it was John F. Kennedy was the one that inspired my political career. Anybody that got out of law school in 1961, you were very influenced by Kennedy. And I wandered into the Colorado legislature in 1967, and, uh, it, 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 and I, I moved to Colorado. I didn't know a soul. I mean, this is a correctable system. Keep the faith. Yeah. Hi. I also voted for you in the Reform Party. I actually registered with the party just in time to vote. Been meaning to change my registration back at some point. <laughs> I um, wanted to ask you about immigration because I'm a big fan on just about every other issue. And two questions about it specifically. One is that society changes, technology, skyscrapers, everything. Isn't it possible we're more capable of handling a billion people today in this country than four million in 1790? Just like we're ca more capable of handling 250 million. Um, secondly, I've always felt that even if um, immigration or some other population growth in the U.S. reaches a point where it hurts our country a little bit, clearly if we all of a sudden instantaneously had five billion people in the U.S., that'd be a problem. But um, at the current levels of immigration, it seems like even if it marginally hurts the U.S., even if it gets to that point, isn't it possible that for those immigrants, it's much better here than it would be in the countries they're coming from, at least where we're talking about immigrants coming from poorer nations. So, doesn't it then become an issue of um, America first? Distributional justice. America first, that's different. Well, if you're saying that um, we ignore how much better it is for the immigrants here yeah. and only consider how much well, it costs us. The yeah, answer to your first question is yes, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Nobody can tell. I mean, it's in the womb of time that, we're, uh, that it well could be. But I, I think it depends on how strongly you believe in technology. But then I think, number one, is America should put its own poor first. I think that, uh, listen, we should really reach down. We've got a nation-threatening problem, our own underclass. Why we bring in additional unskilled labor? We should be training our own labor. I believe in David Ricardo's uh, Iron Law of Wages. That I think that there's, you got the open border liberals and the cheap labor employers that get together and, and, and bring in all this labor to the detriment of our own people. But I do think that second of all on your question, I was named, my wife and I were named Humanitarians of the Year because of our work that we did in, in Cambodia. We would spent some time in Cambodia and we went over there in 79 when the killing fields were going. But I don't see where you're doing any good to take a few lucky people, a few lucky people, and have them allow them to immigrate to the United States. Pe most people are going to have to bloom where they're planted. Most people are going to have to develop where they are. And I think that the real question is the United States has a duty to the rest of the world. We have a duty because we're a wealthy nation. But I don't think you take a few lucky people and bring them in here. I think you'd start our own poor. I am all for abolishing. Un I go to Japan, and I see their policy is to try to do away with unskilled labor. And I think that we ought to do, we try to try to move our workforce up that we have right now rather than bring in additional unskilled labor. Sir. Uh, my name's Joe Lou, and I'm a mid-career student here. Um, I have to congratulate you. you. You do the doom and gloom talk much better than Paul Songus or Malthus. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I think what really bothers me about this vision of government that you've outlined is that it's one where social engineering is its primary responsibility. Who lives, who dies, who has children, how many children, and by implication, what you're allowed to eat, what you drink, how much you exercise. And that, to me, is so fundally, fundamentally different than my vision of what America's about, its history, and where we've always looked forward to. I mean, where's room for liberty and choice in this picture? Well, um, I'm sorry I came across that way. I mean, I, I, I listen to Harry Brown of the Libertarian Party, and I get really, you know, I definitely feel that one of the great challenges is also reconceptualizing government. And so I certainly, I think the question in medical care it's not social engineering, it's that the miracles of medicine have outpaced our ability to pay. I mean, I'm not playing God, the technology's playing God. I'm saying that at some point, we just can't continue to throw limited resources in, in, a, in a long shot medicine. But I, I don't plead guilty at all. I, I plead guilty to that one, but not to the other things. I'm not trying to say where people exercise or anything else. I mean, I, I really think that my generation of Democrats have been very disillusioned with the role of government, and we do agree that there's too, that tentatively agree that there's too much regulation and too much, too much intrusion. We're, we're much, but in other words, I think that on the medical area, you're right. I think it's painful, but it's necessary. On the others, I, I can't quite get the evidence or what I said that might have led you to that conclusion. I don't think it's right, but on the other hand, well. 
But this is <laughs> this is going to have to be the last question tonight because uh, uh, we are running short on time, and I'd like uh, to ask all of you when we're done with uh, the forum tonight, you're going to need to leave by the courtyard door, which is around behind this sign down the stairs. Uh, so you have the last question. Sorry to Sarah and the others. Uh, Governor Lamb, my name is Ken Miller. I am a former uh, candidate for step state representative in Ohio. I'm an unemployed engineer trying to live on $120 a month in food stamps. And I'm also an applicant to the Doctor of Science program in health policy and management over at the Harvard Graduate School of Public Health. Uh, but as I looked at your slides uh, tonight, uh, I thought of my travels in Europe. And one of the striking things about the European educational system is both law and medicine are undergraduate subjects in Europe. Uh, when people graduate from high school, they can go through a four-year course in medicine or four-year course in law and begin practicing. Uh, Germany spends 6% of its GNP in healthcare. Switzerland creates an industry in importing retired people from other parts of Europe and providing for their needs. Uh, and at the same time have twice as many healthcare workers per capita as the US. Do you think learning lessons from Europe, doubling the number of healthcare pro professionals in nursing or medicine, or perhaps changing uh, medis the medical profession and legal profession to undergraduate professions and perhaps elevating uh, science or engineering or politics to uh, higher status levels in our society could contribute to some of the reforms uh, that you feel are needed here in uh, the United States. Boy, what a last question. <laughs> no, I think that that's, you're, you're thinking different thoughts. I mean, that's what you're, I, I do think that the, you know, um, I do think that we have to sort of rethink how we do everything. And I think that as you go into an aging society, you're going to have to, we move more to chronic disease. I mean, what my generation has done is reduce mortality, but we've increased morbidity. We've reduced chronic, we reduced acute disease, but we've thrown ourselves in the arms of chronic disease. That takes, that takes a different type of health care. It takes less high-tech health care and more hands-on health care. I think that that applies in a lot of things. I think you're right. I think that we shouldn't, I, I would, I'd try very hard to get my students to think very seriously before they want to go to law school because I think there's a coming glut and we and I do think that we should emphasize that we we are spending too much of our time and great talent 40 percent of the Rhodes Scholars go to law school I think that's a terrific waste of society that needs to be competitive and so <laughs> wow what a question let me end with this Howard Nimeroff was America's poet laureate until he died two years ago. But he has a little poem that I'd like to end with. And it goes like this. He says, praise not end the go-ahead zeal of whoever it was that invented the wheel, but never a word for the poor soul's sake who thought ahead and invented the brake. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we need some brakes. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Good night. I should have left more time for questions. I always enjoy the questions better. <laughs>